Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. We welcome you to this session of Health Essentials as we continue talking about the various systems of the human body. And this week, we're going to cover the brain and the cranial nerves. So I thank you for joining this afternoon, and I pray that God is continually perfecting that which concerns you. Amen? Amen. All right, well, we're just going to go into prayer, and I'm going to jump and dive right in to what God has given me to share with you on this day. Amen? All right. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we thank you, Lord God, for another day's journey, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that you're a good God. Hallelujah. And all the praise, honor, and glory goes to you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that you have exciting plans for us always. Hallelujah. And we thank you, Father, for what you've done, what you're doing, and what you're going to do concerning our health and wellness, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for the information that you continually give me to share with your people, Lord God, on this platform. And I pray that it continues to resonate with them in a way that only you know how to do, Lord God. Give me your precious Son, Jesus, and your Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I'm going to dive right in. And again, I continually pray that God is perfect, perfecting all that which concerns you where your health and wellness is concerned. I tell you, this information has truly, truly been a blessing, you know, um, in my daily activity. So I know it has to be with you as well, because as I go out through my day and I run again into situations concerning people's health, you know, I know in doctors and um, health professionals, I know exactly what they're talking about because of the information that God has given me uh, through this platform, through the House of Joy Miracle Deliverance Church to share with you. So um, as you can see, I have a depiction of the brain in the background just a little bit that um, so you can see where everything is situated. But let me just jump right in with what God has given me. Amen. All right. So um, solving an equation as we continue to talk about the brain and the cranial nerves. It requires the brain to create equations, correct? All right. So one of the most complex and fascinating structures in the human body is indeed the brain. Wow. The body is capable of almost anything, but nothing is possible without the brain receiving information, analyzing the data, and taking action. All right. From the exterior, the brain is protected only by bone, meninges, and fluid. Internally, the blood-brain barrier acts as a gatekeeper by identifying substances and other granting or denying entrance into the brain. We'll get a little bit more deep into that in this session. So each section of the brain is highly specialized in its duty, yet the organ works as a united machine. Right. Although the brain has amazing potential in thoughts and actions, just minutes of deprivation in blood or oxygen can shut the machine down. All right. So the brain is aware of its surroundings via input from the spinal cord. We talked about the spinal cord and how everything from the, the body communicates to the brain and then the brain back to the body. Just with Christ Jesus. Jesus is the head and we are the body. So the body has to communicate with the brain and then brain Jesus communicates back to us and give us information that we need, right? Praise the Lord. So the brain is aware of its surroundings via input from the spinal cord and cranial nerves. Cranial nerves with sensory functions allow us to smell and see. Nerves with both motor and sensory functions are responsible for everything from tasting and chewing to breathing, the beating of our heart, right? Simple tasks such as smiling or swallowing, are all made possible by the cranial nerves. Wow. So we know also that trauma to the brain or cranial nerves devastates more than trauma to any other organ or body system, all right? How important is the brain? Very important and for us to take care of it. And did you, if you ever looked at a um, walnut, uh, walnut, yeah, a walnut. So it's, shaped just like the brain so next time you get a walnut crack it open and, and take hopefully you get a whole one and it doesn't go in half so that you can see how it's shaped just like the depiction that i have in my background there a walnut is shaped exactly like the human brain 
And guess what? Walnuts are nutritionally sound and balanced to support the brain. All right, the function of the brain. So get out your walnuts and begin to eat some walnuts, more of them, all right? So let's move on. Now, the um, brain, cranial nerves, and homeostasis. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about that. So your brain contributes to homeostasis by mediating complex functions through sensory output, integration of new and stored information, all right? Making decisions and signaling actions. So anything that you um, learned in the past, you know, you can recall it via the brain, right? The body is going to go tell the brain that, hey, we need to go in our brain files. You know, you've heard that um, the brain call that. You can go into your brain files and look for information. Well, it does exactly, that's exactly what it does. Praise the Lord. So let's move on and talk about um, the major parts of the brain. All right. So the neural processes needed for each of these activities occurs in a different region of the brain. All right. Make sure my volume is up there. So The portion of the central nervous system contained within the cranium, all right? That involves helping you to solve an equation. When you're feeling hungry, when you're laughing, these neural processes are in action, all right? So about 100 billion, 100 billion, right? Neurons and 10 to 50 trillion neuralgia make up the brain, wow which has a mass of about 13 grams. So the brain is just about three pounds in adults, okay? So on average, each neuron forms 1,000 synapses with other neurons. We talked about synapses in our last session. And the synapses, as you know, is a junction between two nerve cells consisting of a minute gap across which impulses pass by diffusion of a neurotransmitter. All right, as we I gave you the example of when you bump your toe or um, accidentally hit your thumb with a hammer, how it takes a minute before that pain to come because the body has to communicate with the brain first. And the brain tells the body, hey, you know, we've been hurt. All right. So again, on average, neuron forms 1,000 synapses with other neurons. So the total number of synapses, about a thousand trillion, is larger than the number of stars in the galaxy. <laughs> This is good stuff. The brain is the center for registering sensations, correlating them with one another, and with stored information, making decisions and taking actions. Again, it is also the center for the intellect, our emotions, our behavior, and our memory. But the brain encompasses yet a larger domain. It directs our behavior toward others with ideas that excite, artistry that dazzles, or rhetoric that memorizes, right? One person's thoughts and actions may influence and shape, you know, the lives of others, as um, we'll go into the uh, more detail, that different regions, as I mentioned, of the brain are specialized for different functions, as well as different parts of the brain work together to accomplish certain functions. So we're gonna cover um, quite a bit, bit of that, all right? Um, also how the brain is protected, how it's nourished, what functions occur in the major regions of the brain, and how the spinal cord and the 12 pairs of cranial nerves connect with the brain, all right, via the spinal cord. Now, brain organization, protection, and nourish nourishment. So the brain consists of four major parts. I'm just going to give you a, a, a brief uh, explanation of each. Um, again, to give you an idea of how this particular system of the body operates, because we don't want to be destroyed for lack of knowledge, amen? And when you go to your doctor, you know, you can um, be well informed, you know, whatever information he be tell he's telling you <laughs> concerning your body, your brain, any, any part of your body, at least you'll be well informed and you'll know for yourself. Just like in God's word, you know, we can hear, you know, from the preacher, we can hear from the teachers and the pastors and the evangelists and so forth. But you better get into that word. It's very important for you to better get into that word for yourself. So you can know for yourself. Amen. 
All right, so major parts of the brain. Again, the brain consists of four major parts. The brain stem, the cerebellum, the diencephalon, and cerebrum. All right, as you can see in my depiction back there. The brain stem is continuous with the spinal cord and consists of the medulla oblongata, pons, and midbrain. Posterior to the brain is the cerebellum, all right? The little brain, it equals the little brain. Cerebellum actually means little brain. So superior to the brain stem is the diencephalon. D means through, encephalon means brain. Consisting mainly of the thomalus and the hypothomalus, and including the epithomalus and the subthomalus, all right? Supported on the diencephalon and brain stem, the cerebrum is the largest part of the brain. Cerebrum, it can mean brain, and it's the largest part of the brain, all right? So there it is right there, and I'll move my head over so you can see in the depiction. And I hope that you can see it right there. It's our cere cerebellum. cerebellum. Okay, connected directly to the spinal cord. All right. So let's go on and talk just a little bit about the brain blood flow and the blood brain barrier. Isn't it amazing we have a blood brain barrier? So blood flows to the brain mainly via the internal carotid and vertebral arteries. The internal jugular veins return blood from the head to the heart, all right? In an adult, again, the brain represents only 2% of total body weight, 2%, but it consumes about 20% of the oxygen and glucose used at rest. Neurons synthesize ATP almost exclusively from glucose via reactions that use oxygen um, in the mitochondria, all right? So activity of neurons and neuroglia increases in the region of the brain. Blood flow to that area also increases. Even a brief slowing of brain blood flow may cause unconsciousness, as we know. Typically, an interruption in blood flow for one or two minutes can impair your neuronal function, and total deprivation of oxygen for about four minutes can cause permanent injury. So because... There's virtually no glucose is stored in the brain, no sugar, all right? The supply of glucose also must be continuous. So uh, glucose, sugar is not stored in the brain, so it has to be continual. If blood entering the brain has a low level of glucose, mental confusion, dizziness, convulsions, and loss of consciousness can occur. And as you know, this can happen in people, people with a condition called uh, diabetes, Okay. So the existence of the blood-brain barrier, the BBB, protects brain cells from harmful substances and pathogens by preventing passage of many substances from blood into the brain tissue. So tight junctions seal together the endothelial cells of brain capillaries, which also are surrounded by a thick basement membrane. And in addition, the processes of many astrocytes, and this is one type of neuroglia, Pressed up against the capillaries, the astrocyte pro processes selectively pass some substances from the blood to the neurons, but inhibit the passages of others. Isn't that amazing? So let me say that. I'm going to say it one more time. The astrocyte processes, okay, and it's a type of neurology that astrocytes are. They selectively pass some substances from the blood to neurons, but inhibit the passage of others, the blood-brain barrier. A few water-soluble substances, for example, glucose, sugar, cross the blood-brain barrier by active transport. Other substances such as creatine, urea, and most ions cross the blood-brain barrier, barrier very slowly, eons. Still other substances, proteins, and most antibiotic drugs do not pass at all from the blood into the brain tissue. However, the blood-brain barrier does not prevent passage of lipid-soluble substances, such as oxygen, carbon dioxide, alcohol, all right, and most anesthetic agents into the brain tissue. Trauma, certain toxins, and inflammation can cause a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, okay? So, 
let's talk just a little bit about breaching the blood brain barrier. So I've explained, you know, as much as I could, hallelujah, for a, to a level of understanding to see how the blood brain barrier prevents the passage into brain tissue of potentially harm, harmful uh, substances. But other consequences of the blood brain barrier, efficient protection is that it also pre prevents the passage of certain drugs that could be therapeutic for brain cancer or other central nervous system disorders. So uh, according to my study, researchers are finding ways to remove drugs from the blood brain barrier. In one method, the drug is, is injected in a concentrated sugar solution. Um, the high osmotic pressure of a sugar, sugar solution causes the endothelial cells of the capillaries to shrink, which open gaps between their tight junction and makes the blood brain barrier leaky. So as a result, the drug can enter into the brain. So um, we know that all things, God, nothing, God has made all things. So he has taught man how to do that, even though he has, it's in us, in, inbred in us, born into us, a protective shield of for the brain. All right. So let's move on and talk about protective coverings of the brain just a little bit. The cranium, all right, and the cranial meninges surround and protect the brain. The cranial meninges are continuous with the spinal meninges, have the same basic structure and bear the same names. So they protect um, the brain, all right? And also the cerebrospinal fluid, CSF. So we have cerebrospinal fluid. It's a clear colorless fluid, liquid that protects the brain and spinal cord against chemical and physical injuries. Isn't that interesting? It also carries oxygen, glucose, and other needed chemicals from the blood to neurons and neuroglia. That's why um, when I give you an example, like when women, um, women have um, give birth, they can... Um, but it has to, you have the, uh, whoever's injecting it, the uh, uh, healthcare professional has to know exactly where to inject that needle into the spinal cord so that it will um, inhibit the function of maybe your lower body um, or any other part of your body. But they have to know exactly where to inject that needle, especially for, say, like surgery. Um, if you have knee surgery or hip surgery or what have you, they have to numb your lower body. So that uh, administrative uh, personnel has to know exactly where to inject that needle and be right on, dead on. They can't miss, all right? So um, they, do, they actually put it right there in the CSF, the cerebrospinal uh, fluid. So again, it's a colorless liquid um, that protects the brain and spinal cord against chemical and physical injuries. It carries oxygen, as I mentioned, glucose and other needed chemicals from the blood to neurons and neuroglia. So, um, cerebral spinal fluid continuously circulates through cavities in the brain and the spinal cord and around the brain and spinal cord in the subarachnoid space. All right, so let's move on and talk just a little bit about um, the formation of the cerebral spinal and the ventricles. And I won't go into a long explanation. I'm just going to name them what they're what they are. So. The cerebral spinal fluid cavities within the brain, they're called ventricles. Ventricles means little cavities, okay? There's a lateral cav uh, ventricle, right? Um, there's a third ventricle and there's a fourth ventricle. So let me give you just a brief explanation. <laughs> So the lateral ventricle is located in each hemisphere of the cerebrum, okay? Anteriorly, the lateral ventricles are separated by a thin membrane called the septum pellucidum. Septum pellucidum, all right? The third ventricle is a narrow cavity along the midline superior to the hypothalamus and between the right and left halves of the thalamus. The fourth ventricle lies between the brainstem and the cerebellum. So that's all I'm going to give you on that. All right. Um, there's mechanical protection. There's chemical protection. There's circulation. There's uh, the circulation of this uh, cerebral spinal fluid. Um, 
that has to be continuous throughout the body. So moving on, I want to talk about a abnormality briefly in the brain, and it's called hydrocephalus. So abnormalities in the brain, such as tumors, inflammation, or developmental malformations can interfere with the drainage of the cerebrospinal fluid from the ventricles into the subarachnoid sub space. When excess cerebrospinal fluid accumulates in the ventricles, the CFS pressure rises. Elevated CFS pressure causes a condition called hydrocephalus. It's pronounced hydrocephalus. Hydro means water, cephal means head. In a baby in which the fontanels have not yet closed, the head bulges due to the increased pressure. If the condition persists, the fluid buildup compresses and damages the delicate nerve tissue. And hydrocephalus is relieved by draining the excess cerebral spinal fluid. So anyone that's um, suffering from that condition has to go, you know, I guess regularly to get that fluid drained. So a neurosurgeon, they may implant a drain line called a shunt into the lateral ventricle to divert a cerebral spinal fluid into the superior vena cava or abdominal cavity, okay? In adults, hydrocephalus may occur after head injury, meningitis, or subarachnoid hemorrhage, all right? So that's just one condition that affects the brain of many, that can affect the brain. So let's move on and talk a little bit about the brain stem. As you can see right here in my depiction, the brain stem is right there within the midbrain, near the midbrain, okay? So the brain stem is a part of the brain between the spinal cord and the dicephalon. It consists of three structurally and functionally connected regions, the medulla oblongata, number one, two, num the pons, and three, the midbrain, as you can see right there. The brain stem, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata, okay? So extending through the brainstem is the reticular formation, a net-like region of dispersed gray and white matter. Boy, I'll tell you. The medulla obligata, or simply the medulla, let's put it that way, is a continuation of the spinal cord. It forms the inferior part of the brainstem, and the medulla begins at the foramen magnum and extends to the inferior border of the pons, a distance of about three centimeters. So, um, there's white matter, you know, in all the sensory and motor functions of that area. Um, they, they, these protrusions, they're called pyramids as well. Um, they control, it explains why one side of the brain controls movement on the opposite side of the body, okay? The medulla also contains several nuclei, masses of gray, where neurons form synapses with one another. Um, the cardiovascular center regulates the rate and force of the heartbeat and the diameter of blood vessels. You know, it does quite a bit. The medullary rhythmicity area of the respiratory center adjusts the basic rhythm of breathing. Other nuclei in the medulla control reflexes for, you know, throwing up, for coughing and sneezing. Isn't that interesting? So neurons here, they relay impulses from Propios receptors uh, monitoring joint and muscle positions to the cerebellum. We're talking, all this is happening within the brain, okay? And, and the communication of the brain stem communicating with the spinal cord, okay? So um, it's just very, um, it goes on and on, and I, I won't get so more, more, deep, more deep into it, but just so that you have a basic understanding of how much um, the brain is involved in the functioning of the body, the head. This you know, controls the brain, but yet the body has to communicate to the brain and then the brain communicates again back to the body to tell it what to do. So injury, if there's, in case of an injury of the medulla, so given the many, many, many vital activities controlled by the medulla, it's not surprising, you know, that um, say that you, if you get hit in the head, you, know, you get a hard blow in the back of the head, right back here where that where it's located. 
uh, or upper neck can be fatal, all right? Damage to the medullary rhythmicity area is particularly serious and can rapidly lead to death. Symptoms of non-fatal injury to the medulla may include cranial nerve, malfunctions on the same side of the body as the injury, paralysis and loss of sensation on the opposite side of the body, and irregularities in breathing or heart rhythm. All right, that's just a little bit about the medulla oblongata. You can see where it's located there in my depiction. Let's move on and talk just a little bit about the pons, and they lie directly superior to the medulla and anterior to the cerebellum. Um, they're just about one, 2.5 centimeters. Uh, like the medulla, the pons consist of both nuclei and tracts, and it implies the pons is a bridge that connects parts of the brain with one another, okay? These connections are provided by bundles of axons. Some axons of the pons connect the right and left side of the cerebellum. Others are part of ascending sensory tracts and descending vertebrae tracts, all right? That's just a little bit about the pons. Now, they also help um, in areas um, to control breathing, all right? Let's move on and talk just a little bit about the midbrain. The midbrain or the mesothelium extends from the pons, as you can see, to the dicephalon, the encephalon. The cerebral aqueduct passes through the midbrain, connecting the third ventricle above with the fourth ventricle below. Like the medulla and the pons, the midbrain contains both tracts and nuclei. All right. So um, it does quite a bit as well controlling um, receptors for hearing in the ear. Uh, they also reflex centers for startle reflex, like sudden movements, you know, if you get uh, startled by a loud move, you know, uh, uh, a loud sound rather, <laughs> uh, and then you, you get startled by that and you jump, you know, you know like that or what have you. Uh, movements of the head and body that occur when you are surrounded by a loud noise, okay? So um, that's just a little bit about the midbrain. So let's move on and talk just a bit about um, reticular formation, the brain stem, and just a bit, and then I'm gonna move on and talk about the cerebellum. Okay, in addition to the well-defined nuclei already that I described, all right, much of the brain stem consists of small clusters of neuronal, neuronal cell bodies, gray matter, okay, interspit among small bundles of myelinated axons, which is white matter. All right, so the broad region where white matter and gray matter exhibit a net-like arrangement is known as the reticular formation, all right? So, and it extends from the upper part of the spinal cord, all right, throughout the brainstem and into the lower part of the encephalon, okay? Neurons within the reticular formation have both ascending sensory and descending motor functions, all right? So let's, I'm just all I'm going to, to share about that. <laughs> all right, let's move on and talk just a little bit about the cerebellum, as you can see where that is. Let me move my head over that way. Yeah. And you can see the cerebellum is located right there at the bottom. Of, let's see, near the brain stem. Okay. So the cerebellum is the second largest part of the brain. It occupies the inferior and posterior aspects of the cranial cavity. It accounts for about a tenth of the brain mass, yet contains nearly half of the neurons in the brain, the cerebellum. The cerebellum is posterior to the medulla and pons and inferior to the posterior portion of the cerebrum, all right? A deep groove known as the transverse fissure and the tentorium cerebella, which supports the posterior part of the cerebellum, separate the cerebellum from the cerebellum. Okay, so that's just a little information about that. And it um, goes on and on, and I talk, I'm gonna talk briefly to explain the main function, uh, a main function of the cerebellum is to evaluate how well movements initiated by motor areas in the cerebrum are actually being carried out. So when movements initiated by the cerebral motors are not being carried out correctly, the cerebellum detects the discrepancies 
and then sends feedback signals to motor areas of the cerebral vortex via its connections to the red nucleus and thomalus. Okay, the feedback signals help correct the errors, smooth the movement, and coordinate complex sequences of skeletal muscle contractions. Um, besides coordinating skilled movements, the cerebellum is the main brain region that regulates posture and balance. Okay. These aspects of cerebral functions make possible all skilled muscular activities from catching a baseball to dancing to speaking, okay? And I will say even like, you know how when you wake up in the morning and you know you get up, well, I know as, as, as we age, you get up and you kind of have a lot of creaks and cracks and things aren't quite working, functioning properly. Or even if, you know, young people, you get up and you're still not quite um, moving properly because you still have sleep. So that's what, um, but it, but the body yet uh, corrects it through the cerebellum, okay? It evaluates it first. Why aren't we working properly? And then it communicates, as I mentioned, um, to the, uh, to the it detects, excuse me, cerebellum detects the discrepancies, and then it sends feedback signals to motor areas of the cerebral vortex so that it can be corrected, and then you, know, you start moving normally, if that makes sense. All right. So that's a little bit about the cerebellum. Bellum. Let's move on and talk about the diencephalon just a little bit. Um, the diencephalon, let's see, it's up here, my depiction, which is of the top, of upper part of the, the back of the brain, extends from the brain stem to the cerebrum and surrounds the third ventricle. It includes the thomalus, the hypothomalus, as you can see, the thomalus, um, the hypothomalus the epithomalus, and the subthomalus. Okay. The thomalus um, measures about three centimeters. Um, it consists of paired oval masses of gray matter, uh, praise the Lord, and it um, is the major relay station for most sensory impulses that reach the primary sensory areas of the cerebral cortex from the spinal brain, brain stem, and midbrain. All right. Let's move on. Uh, there's quite a bit about the thomalus um, that I don't want to go into deep explanation about, but I'm just going to put it out there, the names of it, all right? We have the um, interior nucleus, the medial nuclei, the lateral group. Um, we have the intralaminar nuclei, the midline nucleus, the reticular nucleus, um, and that's just a, a bit of the composure of the thomalus, thalamus. Yeah, thalamus, T-H-A-L-A-M-U-S. Thalamus means inner chamber. Thalamus, inner chamber. Let's move on and talk about a little bit about the hypothalamus. Hypo means under. It's a small part of the encephalon located inferior to the thalamus. It is composed of a dozen or so nuclei in four major regions. All right. The mammillary bodies, the infundilum, the medium eminence. Um, it goes on and on of, of a lot of inf uh, information about the hypothalamus, and it, it um, involves production. It can uh, the um, hormones in our bodies produces. It actually produces several hormones, and has two important connections with the pituitary gland. Um, has, it um, supports the regulation of emotional and behavior patterns, the regulation of eating and drinking. We're talking about the hypothalamus, okay? The control of body temperature and the regulation of circadian rhythms and states of consciousness, okay? Let's move on and talk a little bit about the epithalamus, okay? Now, the epithalamus, epi means above, epi equals above. A small region superior and posterior to the thalamus consists of the pineal gland and the hybenular nuclei, all right? So the pineal gland, pineal means pine cone-like, is about the size of a small pea. You can see it right there in my depiction, right there. All right. And protrudes, protrudes, excuse me, from the posterior midline of the third ventricle. The pineal gland is part of the endocrine system because it secretes the hormone melatonin. Wow. 
As more melatonin is liberated during darkness than in light, this hormone is thought to promote sleepiness, melatonin. Melatonin also appears to contribute to the setting of the body's biological clock. All right. You know how we, you, we travel to other countries that are, you know, their time changes and so forth. So it helps us to um, adjust to that particular area by secreting melatonin. Interesting, huh? All right. So um, that's, that was the hypothalamus, okay? Just a little bit about the epithalamus. Again, let's see. So we talked about, talked about within the cerebellum, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, a little bit about the epithalamus, okay? And it's a small superior region. As I mentioned, uh, the pine cone light, blah, blah, blah. The subthalamus, the lamus, is a small area immediately below the thalamus. It includes tracts and pairs of subthalamic nuclei. nuclei. Um, they work together with the basal ganglia, cere cerebellum, and cerebrum in the control of body movements. Okay? All right. And the cerebrum, we're going to cover that briefly. Um, more in depth into our next session, but I'm going to explain to you what it is. The cerebrum is the seat of intelligence within the brain. Okay. It provides us with the ability to read, to write, and speak, to make calculations and compose music, and to remember the past, plan for the future, and imagine things that have never existed before. This is the cerebrum. All right, right there. The right and left halves of the cerebrum called cerebral hemispheres. They consist of an outer rim of gray matter, an internal region of cerebral white matter, white matter and gray matter nuclei deep within the white matter. The outer rim of gray matter is the cerebrum cortex. Cortex means rind or bark, okay? All right, so during... Um, you know, when a baby is being developed in the embryo, the embryonic, excuse me, embryonic development, um, during that time when brain size increases rapidly, the gray matter of the cortex enlarges much faster than the deep white matter. So as a result, the cortical region rolls and folds upon itself. And those folds are called GRI, which that's either here nor there but just that you know the name of what that is. All right. Okay. So I'm going to stop right there and we're going to talk um, more about the lobes of the cerebrum, the white matter, just a little bit more about that area of the brain. Um, there's so much involved with our brain. We're going to talk on our next um, session. Um, I'm going to go over again about the function um, of the brain stem the cerebellum, the diencephalon, and the cerebrum. Just do a brief um, over review of that in our next session. All right. Again, to give you a basic understanding of how the brain functions. Within, let me go back. Within. Is the Lord, the brain, and the cranial nerves. All right. Okay. So I know someone has gotten something out of that, and I know it was a lot of information that was um, presented to you this morning concerning the brain and the cranial nerves. That, that's not even all of it. That's not even half of it. <laughs> so, um, and remember, you can always go back and listen to the recording, you know, just listening to it and hearing about it. Um, will uh, give you a, a better understanding, you know? We don't want to be destroyed, you know, for lack of knowledge, not knowing how these, again, these 11 systems of this physical physical body function and how we are responsible for uh, being good stewards of these bodies until Jesus comes. Amen? Amen. All right. Were there any questions, comments, or concerns? Let me look. Make sure nobody, nope. Okay. Again, that was a lot of information shared. Go back, listen to the recording. Um, I thank you again for joining in. 
this afternoon to Health Essentials. So very thankful again for this platform via the House of Joy Miracle Deliverance Church. Our late pastor, um, Angelica Beecham, she's the one that got this going, got it set up. And I, I it's, it's been a privilege. It's truly, truly a privilege to be able to share on this platform information that the Lord has given me um, to share with you. And also, um, you know, I'm going to start talking about, um, when I talk about each system of the body, about how to nourish that particular area of the body. I did mention, um, you know, walnuts support the function of the brain because the a walnut is shaped exactly like a brain. You know, it's, it's just amazing um, how God has made that one to be. So, all right. Well, with that said, I'm going to close this session unless anyone has any questions, comments, or concerns. All right. Okay. Well, let's close out in prayer. Amen. Father God, I thank you and praise you, Lord God, giving you all the praise, honor, and glory, hallelujah, that the goal on this platform, hallelujah, is to teach and to inform your people, to take personal responsibility for their own health, hallelujah, to inform and to educate based on good spiritual principles, Lord God. For you said, Lord God, I will praise thee. According to your word, Psalms 139, 14. We will praise thee, for we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and our soul knoweth right well. So marvelous are your works uh, that you have made through us, Lord God. And our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotions know right well. Hallelujah. So we thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. For this platform, thank you for your continuing love for us, Lord God, because you're a good God. And we know that you sent your son, Jesus, that we would have life and have that life more abundantly. That includes good health. That includes understanding. Hallelujah. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory. And according to your word, 3 John 2, to your people, be the love. I wish above all things that ye prosper. Hallelujah. And be in good health. And be in health, even as your soul prospers. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Here's to you and optimal health. Have a good evening.